Well, and there's a lot of times, too, you've got to consider he's trying to market these stories. So one woman whipping another <laughs> on the cover might attract a 14-year-old boy or two. You know, just saying. And get you the cover and bonus. And get you the cover bonus, <laughs> you know, which is extra money for him. Um, so there were certain methods to the madness, as it were. Um, not to say that these, uh, I mean, because he wasn't just writing just because he liked writing. He was writing to make a living. So, um, you know, there is that aspect to it where sex does sell, even in 19, you know, 32. Um, and even more so maybe in 1932. <laughs> We're a little saturated today. But, uh, but so there is that angle to consider as well. Um, to have, you know, a good looking chick in the story never hurt anybody, uh, whether she be a plot device or a resource or uh, a companion or, um, or the bad guy, you know. Uh, wherever you place her, she uh, earned that place in some way, uh, either by being conniving or by being uh, a friend, uh, Zenobia comes to mind, you know, being helpful, um, even in a small way. That little thing either kicks the story forward or causes the story to happen in the first place or takes it in a different direction. Um, so you know, the way he used a female wasn't necessarily, oh, it's because I gotta get a chick in the story, but there's also that aspect too. I gotta get a chick in the story, otherwise, I may not get the extra money. I may not get the cover. It may not be sexy enough. Um, I may ramble on about the history of the place instead of, oh, let's see how sheer I can make her outfit. You know. Uh, but uh, all women in Howard's work, I find, have some type of a purpose. Um, and, and when we get a female who goes through a character arc, where she makes a change about herself, she makes a decision for herself that affects the story, something like that. When we get that, we get a rounded person. You know, we get a real person that we can look at and say, she's evil, that was hideous, or awesome, isn't that great? She went back and she helped him. Or she's screwing you, dude. Wake up! What the hell? You know, um, you know, Costigan, stop! You know, <laughs> look at what you're doing. You know, she obviously doesn't know anything about cows in New Jersey. <laughs> you know, and she's running away and taking your money. Um, but at any rate, even Mike was fooled half the time on those. But uh, yeah, so I mean, there are those women who were evil and meant to be the bad guy, but sometimes it was for the extra money. It was for the cover. And sometimes, in certain cases, there were some magazines, from what I understand, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, that where they had the artist draw up the picture first, and then they said, I need a story to fit this. Go. And then it was like a competition almost between their top writers or whoever. Um, that happened upon occasion, but usually it's the story and then the cover. Um, so there were those instances as well. So, anybody else? So would you say Howard was uh, kind of a feminist in his own way? Um, I would say that he was definitely pro-woman. Uh, he used to tease a novel in a lot about, you know, oh God, they should have never given you the vote. <laughs> <laughs> and she, of course, would get mad at him and, oh, oh Bob, you know. But, um, but I, you know, I honestly think that he did have an appreciation, and I think it came from Hester. I think it came from seeing yes. this woman who, you know, they moved here, Bob was about nine, I believe. Nine, ten years old, something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so, and, and Doc, of course, had his practice, and he was away for days, weeks at a time sometimes, depending on how, what the ailment was and how sick that person was, or if they were giving birth and they, you know, the uh, labor was taking three days or whatever it was. Um, so he was, it was Bob and Hester, and that was it. And Hester, of course, had tuberculosis probably before Bob even came along. She had suffered from this uh, ailment. And so he had seen her strength, and he had seen her resolve. And even though she was ill, he had seen her working on a farm 
and he had seen her, you know, going into town and doing the errands and, you know, instead of laying a bed and going, oh, woe is me, she had to function. She only had a nine-year-old kid at home. Um, so I think he got a little bit of that from her, uh, as well as an appreciation for the Bible and for poetry and things like this. Um, she had a deep effect on him because it was a lot of the time, it was just the two of them. And so I think in the end, he ended up being pro-woman. He ended up being, um, uh, or desiring someone who had an inner strength as well as perhaps an outer strength. Uh, whereas he, you know, he valued physical ability to himself. He wrote to his uh, buddy Tevis and said, the only woman who will ever take me is a strong woman from the circus or something along these lines. <laughs> Um, you know, she better be a strong woman from the circus. Um, you know, so he had a, a knowledge that, that, you know, the weak and wimpy chick, even though she, okay, she could be used as a plot device, wasn't necessarily in his real life someone that he, he wanted. He, he, I don't think he gravitated towards the clinging vine. He liked Noblin's independence. He liked the fact that she had a direction she was taking in life, that she loved to teach that she had this passion of, of being a speech teacher and being involved in the play and things like this. Um, you know, and he, I think in a secret way in his heart, he had kind of enjoyed saying, honey, how was your day? Which is really cool for, you know, 1934, you know. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say he was pro-woman. I wouldn't go over the line to say feminist, only because that involves certain, I guess, political alignments and mm -hmm. things like that. So it's, a, it's kind of a different word, but I would definitely say he was pro-woman, um, and, and just based on all of the evidence that we have. Yes, anybody else? Yes? She had something, in reading her book, she, she had something to say. She had opinions, and he clearly oh, yeah. wanted to hear it. A lot yeah. of men of that era didn't want to hear the opinions. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's where the teasing came from. We should have never given you the vote. You know, because she had a mouth on her. She wanted to, this is how it is. Um, and I'll give you another thing, too. I don't know how many of you have seen um, the movie, The Whole Wide World. Okay. Some like it, some don't. But there was a part of, um, I listened to the cast commentaries on these things. And D'Onofrio was on the cast commentary along, I believe, with the director. And they got to the scene where Novelin really rips into Bob over something. And D'Onofrio is stating, listen, we were getting ready to do this scene, and she's a little bitty thing, and D'Onofrio is six foot four, you know. Um, and he's saying, listen, if you are going to take this opportunity to really lay into me, do it. And do it with everything you've got. And, um, and she pulls it off in such a way that I think it's true to the character as well. Because, uh, you know, a six foot four guy, if you're five foot two, <laughs> that's a little intimidating, you know, especially if he's yeah, out like this. He says, if you, <laughs> and this is part of the commentary, I'm not being, you know, nasty. He says, if you're going to give it to a guinea, <laughs> give it. You know, you got to lay into this big Italian in front of you. And, and she really did. And it, and it came off. And you realize Novlin had attitude from that scene. Um, which is, and, and I will say that Novelin did see the movie. Uh, she lived long she enough to see it. I understand that um, she did, yeah. Yes, yeah. and she loved it. She did, she, she looked at the screen and said, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's in my book. Oh, I wrote that in my book. Oh my, that's in my book, you know. So scene for scene for scene, it's, it's fairly accurate. Um, they did change the places. I know they had to get him the hell out of that car. They were in the car for too long <laughs> but uh, to make the movie interesting. But the conversations that occurred actually occurred, and it had novel and stamp of approval. So, I mean, how more genuine could you get? I think also on this, um, his pro women is that he felt a sympathy for anyone that had any kind of captivity, and in those days, he said, uh, I think he wrote in one of his letters or something to the effect that he felt sorry for women who were at the mercy of men who, and there was no rules or no laws to protect them except the man's own good nature. And if he didn't have that, there was no protection at all. Yeah. And I think there was also that kind of sympathy for, um, for, and he may have even seen this between his father and mother because in, in those days a woman was subject to a man. I mean, there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. 
Um, Hester was a very, very strong woman. Uh, she had to be because she uh, had to do a lot of things on her own because Dr. Howard was gone a lot. So he had a, a, a sympathy for um, anybody that had to live under the rule of anybody else. And that may have been also why he made strong women that could fight back. Anybody else? Yeah. One small thing. Wasn't there a code, a, kind of a code of honor with Conan, it may have been with the other characters, where if the woman, if he had a one night stand or whatever, if, if she wasn't betraying him, but if she was injured or killed, then he was obligated to revenge her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was kind of a, the part of the, the code of Howard or the code of Conan Yes, it was it was part of the code. Um, even though he may not have had a strong emotional attachment to the girl, it was still a female, uh, usually of the same race, we've got to say that, um, who, you know, in either being injured, kidnapped, killed, what have you, the hero is then propelled to. And again, we're talking about a plot device, too, uh, from a literary standpoint. Um, where she's her death is sort of memorialized by him in avenging it by getting the SOB who, who killed her or who raped her or who kidnapped her um, or rescuing her from kidnap and or killing the guy who's in charge. Um, yeah, that's, that's all part and parcel of, of the code, as it were. Um, and then you get the wonderful scene where he throws the girl into the sewer. Uh, you know, because she screwed him over, you know, he, he, um, he has absolutely um, no qualms about doling out punishments, too. He doesn't kill her, he doesn't rape her, he doesn't beat her senseless, he's not, he's not out and out evil about it. But he does teach her a lesson, you know, he'll give her a good spanking and throw her in a sewer, you know, that's where you belong. You know, and then walk away because she's no longer part of his life. You know, he's divorcing himself completely from that whole aspect um, and, and hanging around that witch. And who wants to hang around a woman who's going to turn you into the authorities, really? Um, and, and what woman wants to be thrown into a sewer? Yeah. <laughs> Not too many of us. I'm telling you that right now. But at the, at the same time, is there a real absolute equality? Because would, it, would he have done the same thing to a guy who screwed him over? A guy who screwed him over, I'm pretty sure he would have killed him. Right. Well, yeah. 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 That, that particular woman's yeah. Yes. In that very story. Yes. Yeah, and, and